The story is not yet over. Your breakthroughs are The divine favor of God is on His way. The blessings of the Lord is on His way. You shall see, listen, you shall see glorious and mighty things. You will see it. Tell your neighbor, you will see it. You will see it. You will see it. You will see it. Hallelujah. I said you will see it. You will see it. You will see it. Hallelujah. Not only will you see it, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. Do that with you. You will feel it. Your eyes shall behold it. You shall relate with it. You shall see the manifestations of the glory of God. You shall see the supernatural move of the Spirit of God in your life. Where you lacked, you will lack no more. Where you wanted debt cancellation, you will see the manifestation of it. Where you have been trusting God for great and mighty things, you are going to see it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. So you're going to see great things. I said you're going to see great things. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not, I'm not speaking to you from a natural standpoint now. I'm speaking to you under the anointing of God. You understand? My position has changed now. Now I'm speaking accurately. I'm speaking specifically. Destinies will change. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You will definitely and positively go to a higher place in the months to come. Your whole life will change for the better. You will see glorious things. You will behold glorious things. You shall touch them. You shall relate to them. When the supernatural move of God will pass others, it will not pass you. You understand? The favor of God will come upon you and stay upon you. Actually, the Spirit of God just told me now, it will stick on you like glue. That's the divine favor of God. And you know why? Because the Spirit of God has provoked you. I said the Spirit of God has provoked you. I said the Spirit of God has provoked you. The Spirit of God has provoked you. Hallelujah. And when the Spirit of God provoked you, you provoke God's Spirit. You know how you did that? You provoke God's Spirit because you gave. Hallelujah. I said 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 you gave. Hallelujah. God will give back to you. I said God will give back to you. I said God will give back to you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosoms. You will see the supernatural move of God. There shall be no lack in your house in Jesus' name. Now, 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 I know there are many smart people, but I'm not dealing with the human psyche now. I'm not relating to your senses. I'm relating to your spirit. God is a spirit. You have a born-again spirit. It's deep calling unto deep. It's spirit relating to spirit. No good thing shall pass you by. Hallelujah. Your bounds shall overflow. The goodness of the Lord shall visit you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. You shall abound with the blessings of the Lord. In Jesus, that's your portion. That's your portion. Now, there may be some people. Now, listen. Listen, this is, this, is, this is important for you to hear. There might be some people around you now that's making you look second class. They are getting preference because they have, they have carried favor. And it looks like you are just second, third, and fourth choice. And God is leaving it like that for a season. Because when they nicely trample you down, He'll raise you up. See, if you are elevated from day number one, there's no testimony. But when they crush you to the ground and bury you and dig a pit and throw you in like Joseph, God's Spirit will raise you up. And the ones that were your enemies shall beg for your forgiveness. Because God is that type of God. He lifts up people. Hallelujah. So there's a lifting up, lifting up, lifting up, lifting up. 
Tell your neighbor there's a lifting up in your life. I said there's a lifting up in your life. Good things are happening to you. Good things are coming your way. The Lord shall exalt you. The Lord will promote you. Hallelujah. Give him a great hand. Amen. Amen. All right. You may take your seat. Thank you so much. Did you receive that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say to you this morning, not only we welcome the visitors, but I want to say to you, to all our church, thank you so much for supporting the meetings and having such great discipline. Amen. So give yourselves a great hand. We appreciate that. Pastor Justice, when he left, he had a good report of the church. He said, your people really know how to receive. Isn't that wonderful? Now, Pastor Justice shared many good things, many great things. And that has really certainly lifted you up in your thinking. It elevated you in your thinking. And I was going to talk to you this morning about confession, but I felt in my heart that I should carry on from where he left. And so I'm going to carry on and talk to you about your relationship with money and you. Now, I'm just going to share some things and throw some things at you. Don't get cross with me. Tell your neighbor, don't get cross with pastor. I didn't come here to offend you. I didn't sleep. You know, I didn't go to bed last night thinking, well, how am I going to offend the church? No, we are teachers of God's word. And you find any true prophet, any true pastor that really relates to God in a great way and relates to the people will always challenge your status quo, will always shift when you are seated in mediocrity. That man of God will always challenge you to go to the next level. And they will bring a certain level of uncomfortableness in your situation. But that doesn't mean to say when your flesh is feeling down and uncomfortable, it means that you must get offended. No, you must make a shift. The statement that really caught me that Pastor Justice did share with us, he said, your mind is hostile to the things of God. And that is the truth. Your mind predominantly is hostile to the things of God only because of wrong information that came into our minds through the years. And that's why God challenges us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. He says, renew your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but renew your mind with the word of God. You see that? So God wants us to renew our mind with the word of God. In other words, if I may put it this way, God wants you to think like how he thinks about different subjects. If you really want to know how God thinks, we have to read and study the Bible to see how God thinks about a particular subject. Because your opinion really doesn't matter to God. God is not an opinionated God. God deals with the facts. God deals with the Word of God. He exalted His Word even above His name. Say amen to that. That means God's measuring stick is His Word. God's level of operating is His Word. God's level of interaction with people, His church, is His Word. You cannot change His Word. He cannot change His Word. And therefore, it will do you well quickly to learn His Word, study His Word, grasp His Word, and start walking in accordance with His Word. Anything else, you will find your life to be miserable. So this is my message to you this morning. I want to share with you on the subject of two words that can change your life. Two words that can change your life. So as I go along, you will discover what those two words are. But my foundational scriptures to you, and I'm going to go quickly. You're going to play catch up. I want to read to you Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. Now, another translation, the revised version of the same scripture in Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first, or perhaps maybe before I give you that, I will give you another translation. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things would be what? Added to you. Another way to say it is, Seek ye first 
The kingdom of God, in other words, God's way of operation or God's way of doing things and all these things will be added to you. So if you want all things to be added to you, what you have to do? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and start to do what God tells you to do. The third way to put it, that scripture goes like this. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and in brackets, the revised version says, the expansion of God's kingdom worldwide. Did you get that? It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And the expansion of God's kingdom worldwide. Hmm? And all of these things shall be added to you. Now, very interesting scripture that. Very, very interesting. If you want things, let's, for example, assume that all those seeds represent things. Those are things. Now, the Bible says, seek ye first. Watch this. He didn't say, direct your attention on things. Now, most Christians do that. The attention is on what? On things. That is not your posture. God said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That means you're going to look the other way. Where should you look to? You should look to God. You should look to the Word of God. You should look at how God does things. Seek you first the kingdom of God. And now watch all those things. Say things, somebody. That's what the Bible says. And all these things shall be. Notice they will follow you. And that is the right position for a child of God. Is that you should seek first the kingdom of God. And all the things that you need, it shall come to you. But the biggest thing that I want to highlight to you in that scripture is the word, the expansion of God's kingdom worldwide. In other words, if you put God's priority first, God puts you first. Say amen to that. Say hallelujah. Say amen. Did you receive that? Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. So who gives you power to get wealth? The system of the world? No, it is God. Say it is God. Tell your neighbor it is God. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy father's as it is this day. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now the sound, man, the sound is brilliant. Leave it like that. That's great. Clap your hands for the sound man. Amen. All right. Because when they really help me with sound, then it relaxes my voice. The more relaxed I am, the better the, the Holy Spirit flows out of me. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. Then I want you to turn to the book of Ecclesiastics chapter 5. And I want you to look at an important scripture there. Alright. I understand I'm going a bit fast but you are sharp, right? Amen. Are you sharp? Amen. Alright. Ecclesiastics chapter 5 and verse number 19. Now let's look at that. It says... Reading from verse 19 and going on to verse 20. And then we'll come to chapter 6 and we'll read verses number 1 and verses number 2 of chapter 6. Now, verse 19 says, Every man also to whom God had given riches and wealth. So who gives riches and wealth? Alright, question. Is God against riches and wealth? No. Because the Bible here says in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verse number 19, God gives riches and wealth. Say that after me. Say, God gives riches and wealth. My first problem was when I came into the kingdom of God, when I was born again, is that I could not relate the two. I thought to be spiritual meant services and praying and reading my Bible and anything that concerned money was carnal. But that was wrong thinking. Say amen to that. Amen. I was thinking wrong. 
I was not thinking God's thoughts. I was thinking my thoughts. Say amen. amen. I remember one time I bought a shoe. I didn't particularly like the shoe. I bought some clothes and then I bought the shoe. They were suede grasshoppers. And I only bought that to look humble. And I bought it and wore it once and then gave them away. Because God spoke to me and said, Humility is not how you look. Humility comes from the heart. God looks at the heart. So you can dress up sharp and be humble. And you can dress up in jeans and still be arrogant. The attitude is not displayed by your clothing or the car you drive. The attitude is displayed by your heart before God. God looks, man looks at the outward stature. God looks at the inward part of man. That's the heart. That's what he told Samuel when Samuel erroneously tried to anoint one of other Jesse's sons except David. He rebuked him and said, no, I look at the heart. Say amen. amen. Tell somebody, God looks at the heart. You see that? So sometimes we come into the kingdom of God and we start to think thoughts about God and about His Word and either from our wrong thinking and also from wrong teaching and we assume, we make the automatic assumption that what we think is right, but really it's wrong. And the way to clarify that and get that corrected is get the Word of God. Say Amen. amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. So he says here in verse number 19, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Underline that in your Bible. That is important. He says this is the gift of God. Boy, isn't that interesting? The gift of God is to give you wealth and riches and make you enjoy the fruit of your labor. It's the gift of God. Say amen to that. All right. Now, verse number 6, and um, chapter 6, rather, and verse number 1 goes like this. It says, There is an evil, say evil, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun. And it is common among men. Oh, very interesting verse of Scripture. It says, There is an evil I have seen under the sun, and it is common amongst men. Very interesting. Because there is an evil one that exists, number two. And it says it's common among men. Now watch, what is the evil? It says, a man to whom God had given riches, wealth and honor. So who gave the man riches, wealth and honor? Come on, talk to me somebody. Is God against it? Say no. So it says, uh, a man to whom God had given riches, wealth and honor so that he wanted nothing for his soul of all that he desired. Yet God given him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is a vanity. And it is what? An evil disease. Do you see that? That means what God's word is saying is that there's an evil under the sun. And it is what? Common among men. If I may venture a little bit, it's common among Christians. They work, and they labor, and they store up, but yet another man eats it. And they don't enjoy it. See that? He says, a man to whom God had given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanted nothing for his soul. For all that he desired, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is a vanity, and it is an evil disease. Now, now let's, let's go back a little bit, backtrack a bit. Chapter 5, verses 19 to 20 tells us what? That riches and honor come from God. Say amen to that. You know that. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 2 tells us something else. Tells us there's an evil under the sun. It's an evil disease. He says this is where God gives to a man and a woman riches and wealth, but they don't enjoy it. Somebody else enjoys it. Now, question. Why should it be so? You remember what the man of God preached when he was sharing. He says, we have what you call what? Holy 
sufferers. Say, my suffering is over. Tell someone next door to you, my suffering is over. You know why your suffering is over? Because understanding cometh. Say, understanding cometh to me. Say, it comes to me. Say, right now, in Jesus' name. Say, devil, you will not rob me. Say, Lord Jesus, open up my mind, my spirit, and my heart. Hallelujah. Now, chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, is not where you want to be. That evil should not visit you. Now, chapter 5, verses 19 to 20, that's where you want to camp. Wealth and riches and honor cometh to me. Say amen to that. And Deuteronomy, God giveth you the power to get wealth. Say hallelujah. All right, then I want to go to Psalms. Look, I can explain them more comprehensively, but I don't have the time. So you, you can go study these verses of Scripture at home. Now, Psalm 35, 27 says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified. That's what we did this morning. Say amen. amen. That's what you did this morning. Your heart was glad. Then you started to make merry. And we sang and danced before God. And what did we say? We said what? We said, let the Lord be what? Magnified. Now, finish that verse of scripture for me. What? Which? Let the Lord be magnified. Is that, is that scripture? Can you show it up on the screen? Are, are you not following me in your Bible? Right, Psalm, let me, let me give it back to you so that you can spot it quickly. I'd like you to turn there, Psalm 35 verse 27. Psalm 35 verse 27. Let the Lord be magnified. Which what? Had, had pleasure in the prosperity of His people or of His servant. The Lord takes pleasure. Oh, come on, here, somebody. You've got to nail this to your spirit, otherwise, I mean, I mean, all, all the wrong teaching can cripple your faith here. It says, the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. Isn't that wonderful? When you start to prosper on the earth, God takes pleasure in it. Say amen to that. Alright, let's go on to another scripture. I want you to turn to 3 John chapter 2. 3 John chapter 2, Third John, the third epistle of John chapter 2. It says, it goes like this. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Now, God's will is revealed to you. You know, a lot of people, and I must say this kindly now so that you don't get upset with me, right? Amen? All right. I've got, got, got to find, choose my words very carefully because a lot of people wear their nerves on the outside. It should rightfully be under your skin. But because it's wrongly put there, I'll have to tread very cautiously. Now, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Now, it is God's will for you to prosper. But take note, this is very important. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as what? Even as your... So your prosperity, now listen carefully, your prosperity on the outside. In other words, the manifestation of prosperity on the outside is dependent on one fact and one fact only, that is your soul prosperity. Now, I want you to understand that your soul does not pertain to your spirit. Other religions, when somebody dies, they say the soul has left the body. The soul of man, rightly divided in Thessalonians, the soul of man, if I'm not mistaken, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think it's verse 23 or thereabout. It says that man is a tripart being, made of what? Made out of spirit, soul, and body. So the spirit of man... The soul of man, his intellect, and the, the spirit of man pertaining to your born-again spirit, 
the soul of man regarding his intellect and the body. That's a tripart human being. So when we refer to the soul of man from a Christian context, what we are saying is that your processes of your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, that's what we refer to as the soul. Now when you die or when you leave the earth, the spirit man and the soul man together, the two of them, they go. The body of man stays behind. But what other religions say, the soul of man, they're actually referring to the spirit of man, but it's not rightly divided in their scriptures. Our scriptures rightly divided. Spirit of man, soul of man, body of man, tripart being of the human being. Say amen. amen. So where is your prosperity? Your prosperity then is dependent on what? On your soul prosperity. As much as your, as your soul, your soul prospers now. Here's the point I want to make, and which is important. This is what Pastor Justice said, that the mind of man is hostile against the things of God. And the reason our minds are hostile against the things of God, because we have wrong information. We've had information in Dunday dating us, either through education or through our upbringing, that has now penetrated our mindsets. And even, if I may say this, it's even gone to the extent where it has fortified places in our mind. In other words, we cannot receive the Word of God on any level because Satan has put those thoughts in our minds. That's why the Bible says we should cast down reasonings, we should cast down arguments, we should cast down things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to what? To the obedience of Christ Jesus. So it is very important to understand that when we teach in church, sometimes your mind may become hostile and you may become offended. Not because the words you are hearing is untrue. It's because you may have a fortified place in your mind or you may have wrong information in your mind against the Word of God that's coming forth. Say amen to that. So what you need to do is, in, when the Word of God comes to you like that, just relax, have a sip of water, and keep on smiling. You will grow. Say amen. amen. I said you will grow. Amen. You will grasp the Word of God. Say amen to that. Amen. Are you with me? All right. It means that the Word of God is not taught or preached to offend you. It is to grow you. Say amen to that. Amen. So 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even what? As thy soul prospers. Now, here's some statements I'm going to throw at you and then you can write them down or take them down or listen to them. Number one, God created man and woman to experience the good life. You got that? Say, the good life is for me. It is not God's will, statement number two, it is not God's will for you to live a life of failure, of poverty and suffering. It's not God's will for you to be in that position. It is God's will for you to live life to the full until it overflows. Say amen to that. That is the good life. And say to someone, I'm heading that way. All right. Statement number three. The entire Bible is God's revealed. Listen carefully to this. The entire Bible is God's revealed plan of complete and full salvation. And when we use the word salvation, we are not only referring to eternal life. When we use the word salvation, it encompasses holistically deliverance, preservation, soundness, health, prosperity. Come on here, somebody. So that means the whole Bible encompasses all of that. If you are poor, it's going to tell you how to become rich. If you are sick and depressed, it's going to tell you how to become what? Healed. If you are living a life not full of joy, but of sadness, it's going to tell you how to live a life of 
gladness. And the day you become a Christian does not mean to say the transaction is fully completed. The day you become a Christian simply means your spirit has now become connected with God's spirit. Are you with me? That's why he places you in a church so that you can be taught the word of God. And that's why a lot of people fight that and they think they're doing God a favor. When the Bible says, neglect not the assembling together of the saints. In other words, God wants you to become a vital member of a church so that you can grow in that church. You can grow with your mind, grow in your soul, grow in your spirit, grow in your relationship. Amen. I mean, listen, a lot of us come damaged from the outside. I mean, some of you, and you know, it's not dependent on your academic qualifications. I mean, you could check in here with a degree and have great insecurity problems. You could be insecure. And when you come in here, God teaches you how to let go of your insecurity and how to relate to other people. Come on here, somebody. Here you can feel loved. You can feel what? You can feel welcomed. You can, be, you can feel part of a family because we are all part of a family at home. You have a mom and a dad. And you are either a daughter or a son. Or, you, you know, you could have, be an uncle or aunt in that greater family. But we all come from families but when you check into church, this is a greater family of God. Are you with me? All of you are brothers and sisters in Christ. Doesn't matter of your language, your creed, or your race. You are what? You are God's children. You are God's inheritance. The Bible says you have been bought with a price. Now that God's bought you out of... Now where did He buy you out of? If you study the parables, He bought you out of the world and placed you in the kingdom of God. And he placed you into his church. It is in his church where you receive God's love and you share it with the world. It is in the church you learn to relate with others correctly. That the rich and poor, as they check in through the door, we're all one. As soon as you come and take your seat in church, there's no rich and poor. We are all rich in the Lord. Amen. Do you understand that? Yes, when we come in here, there's no male and female, no Gentile, Greek, or Jew. We're all one in the faith. Yes, we should not judge each other by the color of our skin or by the look of our face. We are all one in the Lord. Amen. Come on here. Hallelujah. Say amen to that. Amen. And then we can let go of our insecurities. Why? Because God teaches us to love others and he accepts us, so we accept others. Are you with me? But you've got to let go of all of those things. Say amen to that. Alright. So the Bible is God's revealed plan for the complete and full salvation of the whole person. And the whole person pertains to the whole person being number one, spiritually, number two, physically, and materially. Now the good life of abundant living God has generously and mercifully granted to us through a person. Who is this person? Through Jesus Christ. And the day we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, God's transaction was, I have now given you mercy, my grace and my generosity. For all times, I've given you grace. What is, what is grace? Grace is not only God's unmerited favor, but God's willingness to use His power on your behalf to change your life. Woo! Come on here, somebody. God's willing. Come on, tell somebody God's willing. When touch somebody like that, say God's willing, God's willing, God's willing, God's willing. Don't be tight now. Don't be tight. Just touch somebody and say God's willing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God's willing to use His power on your behalf to lift you up from your level. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? You have a God that cares for you. You have a God that loves you. You have a God that, you know, is concerned about your prosperity. And that takes me to Psalm 68, verse number 19. And this is how it goes. It says, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits. 
yea, even the God of our salvation. Now, when I use the word salvation, don't stop yourself to think eternal life. No, salvation means deliverance, preservation, healing, prosperity. That's salvation. When God visits you with salvation, the holistic view of salvation is that it touches every area of your life. Mentally, physically, spiritually. You can come into church damaged. God will repair that if you will allow Him to. Say hallelujah. You could come in here with a complex. You can come in here insecure. You could feel like you're nobody. But God through His word will make you somebody. He'll make you feel loved in His house. Hallelujah. Woo! Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Who daily loads us with benefits. Daily. Da I mean He didn't say once a year. In the Old Covenant, you know, there was talk about Jubilee. And you understand what Jubilee is. You know, Jubilee came every 50 years. This is talking about every day. Hallelujah. Look, it depends what level you're operating at. And all of us are at different levels. To the poor man that has no food, a loaf of bread is a miracle. A man that's taking a bus or a taxi to work suddenly has a motor car. That's a miracle. To somebody who has somebody sick in your family, and all of a sudden God heals them. The doctors couldn't find a cure, but God supernaturally intervenes and heals them. That's a miracle. To another person who has an average person as a student in their family, a daughter or a son that's going to school, but we're just getting flat, you know, just the pass mark. All of a sudden, hits 80%. That's a miracle. Come on here. For somebody that has been unemployed for a long time, and all of a sudden gets employment, that's a miracle. God daily loads us. I said, God daily loads us. Come finish it. God lay, daily loads us with benefits. Daily. I got, I got, a, I got, a, I got, a, I got, a, I got a word for somebody. I got a word for somebody. Don't worry, that baby is just excited. Hallelujah. When I mean, everyone's keeping quiet, if I interpret that correctly, it's saying, Amen, Pastor. Amen, Pastor. That's baby language 101. <laughs> now think about that. God daily loads us with benefits. That's beautiful. I got a word for some people here today. Your daily has started. I said your daily has started. Your miracles have started. I'm telling you, your abundance has now begun. Your abundance has begun. Your, your, your supernatural move has now begun on your behalf. God will show himself strong to you. You will see supernatural things like you've never... Listen... You know, Pastor Zubayl and I were talking, and maybe somewhere along the line, somewhere I must teach on the Jubilee, you know, uh, your Jubilee has begun. No, no serious. Your Jubilee has begun. Now, I don't know about another church, but I'm releasing that word in this church. You know, in a Jubilee time, your debts were wiped out. Your debts were forgiven. Prosperity came like a flood. So I declare to you as a church, your jubilee has begun. Great things shall visit you. Hallelujah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Some of you didn't have jobs will start to get jobs. Some of you that were unemployed will no, no longer be unemployed. God will supernaturally move on your behalf. Some of you who have been on a retrenchment list, your, na your name shall be deleted out of there. Yeah. Some of you have been trusting God for promotion and increase that will come to you. Hallelujah. Some of you where your businesses were not so busy, you will be very busy. I said you will be very busy. Hallelujah. It's begun. It's begun. Your jubilee has begun. Hallelujah. 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 Now you're going to do this by faith. You're going to rejoice before it hits you. I said you're going to rejoice before it hits you. Your jubilee has begun. Great and wondrous things.
have come to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Watch, watch, watch. Watch and see the Lord is good. His mercies endureth forever. Hallelujah. Shake the hands of three people and say, Your jubilee has begun. Hallelujah. 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 Now, hallelujah. Sit down now a minute. We've got so much to do and time is running. It's running. As Pastor Justice said, nine months. Short period of time. Number four. Some say that money and God do not go together and the list goes on and on and nothing can be further from the truth. Money and God are one. Now let me explain to you why. Can I explain to you why? Really, let's talk about money. What is money a representation of? A money, money that you earn at work is a representation of a sum total of your time, energy, that was spent. And when you receive that money into your hands, it is an indication of a time frame in your life that you will never get back again. Because if you worked for the whole month of March and you got your pay packet at the end of the month, what it actually represents to you is that that space of time, the 1st of March to the end of March, that was my energy, my time, my valuable time that went into my work and this is the money I earned. And that becomes now very valuable to you. Right? Now the only thing that's more valuable than the money is your life. Because if I had to take a gun and stick it to your head and say, money or your life, what would you say? <laughs> Are you with me? So then I want you to understand that. So your money is a representation of your time and energy. Your life was more valuable than money, so your life was first and your money second. Now, watch this. Now God understands that because He's given you the power to what? To get wealth and in, to, do, to be successful. He, he's given you the power, He's given you the life, He's given you the energy. He's put a lot of circumstances together collectively to make sure that you're educated or trained in the profession you are so that you can earn what you're earning. Say amen to that. Now when you bring it into your bosom or you bring it into yourself, whether it's in your bank account or in your hands, what is first? First valuable thing to you, number one. Now come and talk to me. I want you to understand this. What is your first valuable thing to you? Number one, your life. Your life. Say, say your life. My life. That's the first valuable thing. Number two is what? My. Alright, let's try that again. Maybe I'll try this side. This side's quiet. I'll try this side, right? What is the first valuable thing to you? Number one. Can I hear you say it? Yeah, you're right. Say it loudly. Scream it. The other two group blocks join them. It's your, your life. Number two. What's the second most valuable thing to you? My. Oh, look at you, my money. If I put some money, you will. Come talk to me. What is the second most valuable thing? Say it again. Your money. So number one is your life, and number two is your money. Very important. You must never forget that. Your life is a representation of you. Your money is your second most valuable thing. Now, God said, because of those two things that I just said, God says, in order for you to prosper, He wants you to what? Sow in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus said, where your, tre uh -huh, where your treasure is, Are you with me? Now, I'm not setting you up for an offering. I'm just merely interpreting what happened the last three days. Because you gave. How many of you gave? 
Come put your, how many of you sowed in the last three days into the special meetings? Wave your hands up high. So I, I'm not asking for another offering this morning. I'm just merely interpreting what you did. Because some of you understand, some of you don't understand, some of you have little glimpses of it, but I'm trying to comprehensively make you understand what have you done. So Jesus said, he says, where your, uh -huh, there would your treasure be. So that means your treasure is important to you. Because it represents what to you? Time, energy, and effort. Now, when you bring your time, energy, and effort translated into money, into the kingdom of God, and you release it, you are saying to God, I trust you. I trust you with my what? Because roughly translated, it's a period of time in your life you have lost. The whole month of March when you worked, you've lost that time frame. You'll never get it back. The person that employed you asked you for your talents and your time and energy and he gave you the equivalent in terms of money, whatever you two agreed on. Now that's something you will never get back. Will you get Feb back? Talk to me, somebody. Will you get the month of Feb back? No. But what did you get in its place? So in other words, what you got was a valuable. Huh? Now God wants to say to you, all right, now that you got that translated into money, what, what's valuable to you, what are you going to do with it? And so he says to you, all right, what I want you to do is, I want you to put me first. Say, put me first. And he says, now watch this, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and the expansion of his kingdom worldwide. And all of these things shall be added unto you. Now he asks you a question. And these are the two words, or maybe I should just hang on a bit. I'll give it to you in a second. Now I know tomorrow's a holiday, right? Is anyone in a hurry to go home today? Can I go a little longer? You're right with that. All right. Let, let, let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper here. All right. We're talking about the correct perspective of money, right? Let me make a statement. We are temporary stewards of the earth's wealth. God the Father is the permanent owner. We are the temporary stewards and God the Father is the permanent owner. Now watch this. Very careful. Watch. When he needs it for his work, it means God, when he needs it for his work, he has to adjust circumstances in order to put some of that wealth into our hands to use it for His glory. Now watch, a very important statement. That means when God wants to get money, or God wants money to be used for the kingdom of God, He can only use it through His people. He can't go to any place outside the church. He has to work within the confines of the church. Because Jesus was really given, Jesus purchased the church on God's behalf. Universally, the church, the universal church belongs to God, right? And who is Lord over the church? Christ. All right? Now, when God wants to use money for the kingdom of God, who does He have to use? He, he uses who? His people. Say me. Say me. Now, in order for you to get money, for him to get money into your hands, he wants to first see whether you are obedient. Yes. Now, watch this. Very important. If you are not obedient with money, he cannot trust you. If he cannot trust you, he will not get money into your hands because you will damn it instead of releasing it. So what he does every now and again he challenges you, like the prove me offering that he did. He challenged you, and you also nicely gave. Most of you did. What happened was, people, whoever, you know, sold towards that offering, they, some of them must have had access, some of them must have really went through dire challenges to bring that money to church, but what happened is it's challenged you. Now God said, okay... I can trust you with 5,000. I'll get more money into your hands. Now, please don't lose me. I'm not taking an offering. 
It's like your mind is... Huh. I can feel it. It's like it's going now. It's like, as pastor, I'm not taking an offering. I'm explaining to you how God works and how God thinks. Say amen. Now, when God can trust you, oh, brother, he'll get money into your hands. I see more people being trusted by God. I see that. I, I, I see God can trust you. Yeah, you know, some people say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I'm just waiting. You know, I only earn 100 rand a week now, but I'm waiting for 200. When I get 200, I'll tie then. I said, two words that will change your life. You want to know what the two words are. You're waiting, right? I've got to give it to you before I release you. Now, there's many other things I want to say to you. All right. Let me make another statement before I give you the two words. The average Christian holds limited concept of God whose resources have never yet been fully tapped. Some of you have never fully tapped God for His resources, but that will change from today. Are you with me? Today, I was driving to church today. I'll just share with you. I I want to talk about you because that's a no-go zone. Let me talk about me, right? Okay. At least, you know, I can get cross with me. I was driving to church And a thought came to my mind this morning after I had prayed. And I was driving to the building. And then I said, Lord, because I was meditating on some scriptures last night. I said, Lord, the land is yours. The silver is yours. The gold is yours. The diamonds are yours. The houses are yours. The buildings are yours. The countries are yours. The continents is yours. I said, Lord, surely you have a land for me and a huge mansion. Yes. <laughs> now, don't get cross with me. I'm just trying to believe God for what I think. Amen. Now, you can believe God for whatever, and, and you'll be said, but don't get cross with me now. This is the first time after a long time, because I was meditating on the scriptures, that I said that. Now, now let, me give you, let me give you some statements now. That, that w- Watch Hebrews 11.6 says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Mm. You got that? Let me give you something else. I'll go, I'll go back now. I'll, g- I'll give you something else. God knows, listen to me. God knows the number of hairs on your head. According to Luke 12, 25, He knows your height. God knows your height. (laughs) You can look it up when you get home. Then, according to Matthew 10, 30, the hairs of your head are numbered. When you brushed Him this morning and a few fell, God took note. His Oh yeah, it's true. God's automatic calculator said, one million, no, lost five. One million minus five. God takes note of the number of hairs on your head. Are are you with me? Luke 12, 6 says, every sparrow is counted. If a sparrow falls, God knows. I'm just trying to tell you how God thinks, right? And according to Psalm 31, 19, Isaiah 64, 4, and Philippians 4, 19, He is concerned about every need that you have. According to Luke 12, 27 to 28, He feeds the birds and clothes the lilies. According to John 10, 10, it is His will for you to live a life full of abundance. Now, this God who loves you so much and even knows how many hairs in your head, does He not care about your day-to-day needs? So I said, Lord, because I've been meditating on some scriptures, the land is yours, the silver is yours. I said, Lord, if you own the land and if you own all the buildings and the houses, surely you can just give me one. See, I lost some of you there. I'm talking about one mansion. I mean, eight bedrooms, four garages, big pool, jacuzzi. I'm not talking about a small house now, I'm talking about a mansion. 
Oh, I didn't ask God where's the money. I didn't relegate myself to the natural. I elevated myself to the supernatural. I said, Lord, you are the giver of good things. Actually, the book of Deuteronomy says, the Lord will make you plenteous in goods. Say amen. Say, I receive that. All right, so if God wants to make you plenteous in goods, surely you can ask Him for something? I asked Him this morning for a mansion. You say to me, Pastor, do you have the money to buy it? That's not my concern, that's His concern. Can somebody not phone me tomorrow and say, Pastor, I'm blessing you with a big house. See some of you, how you're thinking, ah, I've got to get the money first. I've got to get the money first. No. As long as you are a faithful steward with what God gives you, He'll get you anything. So what do you need from God? If you're driving a Skoro Skoro car, can, and, 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 and no problem, I'm not laughing at you, because I drove a Skoro Skoro car too. I had a car that had no floorboard. It was a VW Beetle. The pan rusted, and I could see the white lines on the road. And my prayer was, Lord, don't let my feet go through. I'll be footless. So there is a level that you sometimes have to be there, and you drive an old car. That's okay, but don't stay there. Not against your scorer, scorer. Just don't stay there. That's not your permanent residence. Say, Lord, deliver me from a scorer, scorer. All right? So I'm not against a car. That if, you, if you're driving a car that's not so nice, I'm not against you. Please don't stay there. Trust God for a better one. You say, but pastor, I don't have the money. Well, you, you can just at least tear a picture out of a magazine. Oh, yeah. When I trusted God for my first BMW, this was years back. Oh, I used to drive, I used to drive government cars, see? So they were brand new, but they were not nice cars. I mean, you know, they were the, the common type of average car. But when I would go to the, to the, I used to travel a lot from Johannesburg to Durban and vice versa, but when I used to go to the toll roads, you know, underneath the shelter, when you get a 3 to 5 BMW that comes and it makes that sound, you know that? There's that sound. The men know what I'm talking about. I think the ladies know too. They've wisened up now. You know, you know what I'm talking about, that sound. You know that. Give me another word for it. Help me somebody. Yeah, you know, you know that. You know. And when these guys used to go, the BMWs, the 325, and wow, they should kick that accelerator. And underneath that shelter, I mean, the thing shook. And I said, God, mine sounds like a mouse. So the Lord said to me, the Lord said to me, well, you can trust me for that BMW. I said, I don't have the money to buy it. He says, but never mind, you can tear a picture. So what I did was I took a Reader's Digest, now this is my faith now. I took a Reader's Digest magazine, how many know the Reader's Digest? And you know, it says, win a car, win a BMW, and they had pictures of BMWs. So I tore that nicely and I stuck it on my wall. And I said, one day. <laughs> Come on, talk to me, somebody. I mean, how, how many know, you, you, you understand, I've got a lot more to tell you, but I mean, you know, we'll have to stop just now, but, but we'll pick it up again. I said to this car on the wall, one day, one day. Can you talk to me, somebody? I said, mm, one day. Huh? One day you'll be in my hands, one day. So every time I would drive on the highway, and then here's a BMW passes me by, whoo, and then I'm like, I said, one day, one day, one day. It was not long afterwards I had my first one. But I'm not, I didn't start with the money. It wasn't the building blocks was not money. It was what? A vision in my heart. A desire, a burning desire in my heart. A burning desire. Say burning desire. See, some of you guys want to get married. Some of you girls don't have husbands yet. You want to get married. You know, uh, mm, I want to get married. 
and, and, and the boys too, right? If you, yeah, you thought I forgot you. And the boys too. You're not married yet. When, you, you say, oh, one day I'll get married. One day I'll get... You see, you haven't translated to having a burning desire. Well, one day I'll get a car. You haven't got a burning desire. See, I could not pray this prayer before. And I said, Lord, I trust you for a mansion. Because I had a desire, but not a... This morning I had a... So my declaration to you is whatever you have a burning desire for shall be yours. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Now the two words that I want to share with you and then I'll close and we'll pick it up again, all right? I know time is gone. But just give me another five or ten minutes more. I know I went over time. But tomorrow's a holiday. I want you to turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Now, I'm not talking about the tithe. Say amen. You know how people are in church, they can switch off. They say, oh, there he goes, you know. There's a money pastor, money pastor. Well, can I ask a question? I mean, I mean, you love me, right? Do you love me? Wave your hands at me. Sure? Really? Well, even, even if you don't love me, I still love you. It's okay. Here's the issue. If I asked you, what is the biggest need you have now? What would you say to me? I can't hear you. Everyone needs money. Who does not need money? Stand up, I'll pray that God won't give you any more. Come, who doesn't need money anymore? Oh, I'll pray that prayer and God will hear me. Amen. Elijah prayed, he says, no rain, Lord, the rain stopped. I'll Amen. pray that prayer. It will... Anyone doesn't need money. So you all need money. So is it okay if we talk about money in church? Amen. I'm not trying to take money out of you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get money to you. Say amen. amen. I want you rich and successful, and I want your heart's desires to be granted. So, you know, we use this scripture now to, to, to prove or talk about tithes, but I, I, I'm not talking about tithes. Now listen to what I read. It says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now here what saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to forget about the first part. Because you've heard that a hundred times, right? But the part I want you to start is after the comma. Meet in my house. I don't know if you've got a King James Version. If you have, your comma should come under after house. Now start after the comma. It says, and what? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. That's the two words will change your life. God says to you, to prove. One translation says, listen, one translation says, test me. Actually, it goes like this. It says, put me to the test. Now, I'm not talking in the context of the tithe. I'm, I am talking in the context of money. When God says, when you put and add value to His kingdom, He says, prove me, Amen. test me, put me to the test, and you will see what I'll do for you. Now, watch this. As I begin to close now, it says, If I will what? Not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, there shall not be enough room to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed. And the word blessed actually means empowered to prosper. So all nations should look at you and say, Wow, you are empowered to prosper. Where are you getting this business from? Your status is about to change. But the two words that you should have gotten on grasp, two words that will change your life is what? Prove me. God says, prove me. Now watch this. What he's simply saying to you, this is now when you bring your tithes, your offerings, your pledges and things to the house of the Lord. He says, if you can trust me with what's valuable to you, I will entrust to you riches. And when I move on your heart on the earth to become a distributor, you will distribute. The more I can trust you with, the more I'll get into your hands. 
So in other words, if you want to change your level, what do you do? Change your obedience. In other words, quick obedience will, uh, will allow God to put bigger things in your hands. Faster things. It will come faster your way. And your main priority must be the expansion of God's kingdom. Do you understand? Now, for example, let me, let me loosely translate this. Many of you are tithers here, right? Who are tithers in the church? Let me see your hands. The rest of you, I trust you will become a tither. All right, but many of you are tithers in the church and you give your offerings and you bring your money to church. Now, let me tell you what your money does. Your money, first of all, pays all the bills here. The light, the building, the staff, all of that. It takes care of all of this here. It takes care of your radio programs where we are preaching the gospel and people's lives are being touched. Not necessarily they come to our church, but their lives are being touched. On the TV, it pays for our television pro programs and for the production of the television. It takes a lot of money. All of that is changing lives worldwide. Amen. Now, what is your money doing for you? Expanding the... And when you sow into the local church and you expand the vision of God and expand the kingdom of God, what does God do with your money? He looks at you and says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll get you back the money. I'll meet every need. Even as I know how many hairs on your head and they fall off and I take note of that. The sparrows fall. I take note of that. I take note of your every need. So roughly translated, what am I saying to you? Is that every need of yours will be met. Amen. Say, no more worries. No more worries. Turn yes. around to someone and say, no more worrying. No more. Say, God, God's getting me my money. He's getting me my stuff. Say, I put him to the test. Uh -huh. That's what you've done. You put God to the test. You brought in your money sacrificially. You brought in your tithes. You brought in your offerings. You gave to God. You put him to the what? To the test. What are the two words that will change your life? Where you said to God, Lord, I will prove you. Now stand to your feet. One more scripture I'll read to you before I, I let you go. Hallelujah. Say amen. All right. Now let me read from the Living Bible what it says. It says, try it. Listen to this. It says, try it. Tell your neighbor, try it. It says, now this is God speaking to you. He says, try it. Let me prove it to you. Your crops will be large. This is, this is an, an extract of the Living Bible. He says, he says, try it. He says, let me prove it to you. He says, your crops will be large. For I will guard them from insects and plagues. Your grapes mm, won't shrivel away before they ripen, says the Lord. All nations shall call you blessed for your land, for you will be, you will be, you will be, you will be a land sparkling with happiness. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. I like that. Tell your neighbor, you will be a land sparkling with happiness. Hallelujah. And I, and I don't know about you, but I go crazy over the Word of God because this is necessary food for my soul. You with me? It says, These are the promises of the Lord of hosts. Your attitude towards me has been proud and arrogant, says the Lord. But you say, What do you mean? What have we said that we shouldn't? Listen, you have said. It is foolish to worship God and obey Him. What good does it do to obey His laws and to sorrow and mourn for our sins? From now on, as far as we are concerned, blessed are the arrogant, for those who do evil shall prosper, and those who dare to, to punish them shall be scot-free. Then those who feared and loved the Lord spoke often to, of Him to each other, and He had a book of remembrance. Now this is not talking about you, it's talking about people that scorn the things of God. But listen to this. He says, And those who feared and loved the Lord spoke often of him to each other. And he had a book of remembrance drawn up on which he recorded the names. Uh, you didn't catch that. Every time you give your offerings, every time you give your tithes, every time like you gave your pledges during those meetings, 
God took out the book of remembrance. Took his pen out. Listen. And he recorded in the spirit. Everything that you have given. Watch this. A book of remembrance drawn up in which you recorded the names of feared him and, and who loved him and who think about him. So how do you think about the Lord? By what you gave. Now brothers and sisters, that's why I say to you, and I'm not asking you for an offering now. We've taken the offering. I'm just loosely interpreting what you have done for the last three days. In giving your offerings, your pledges, your tithes, the special offering, God took a remembrance of it. He's recorded it. And then he turned around to the angels and says, go bless them. <laughs> Did you get that? God turned around to the angels and says, go bless them. So some of you, your angels are flying towards you now. It's coming. I said, it's coming. It's about touching you. Say hallelujah. So supernatural manifestation are yours. Within, listen, within the next seven days, many of you will have a testament. That's the truth. Within the next 14 days, many will you will have a testament. The next 21 days, many of you will have a testament. The next 28 days, many shall have a testament. Say hallelujah. What you gave, God shall give you back a hundredfold. What you have sown, God shall give it back to you. Hallelujah. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. When you gave to God, you used two words. God said to you, prove me, try me, test me. When you gave to God, you have now proven Him. God, listen, God cannot but now bless you. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say the blessing of the Lord is mine. Listen, you don't know this, but you know, time has gone now. I have to close. I've already exceeded my time. But already testimonies have come. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Testimonies are coming. I got one, two yesterday already. Where and these are big things that happened. Yours is coming too. I said, yours is coming too. Lift up your hands and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. So I receive it, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Amen. Did you get something? Did you get something? I just threw a few things to tell you that God is not a man that he should lie. God will give it back to you. You watch. Supernatural manifestations. Good things. Pleasant things, needful things. Your mouth shall be filled with laughter. Oh yeah, it will. Oh yeah, it will. Whatever you need is hanging out there. Make a demand. Remember the words that I said, what you should have is a burning desire. But now meditate on it. And as soon as a burning desire, like this morning, last night, I was meditating for about three hours on some scriptures. And the Lord said, the land is mine. The silver is mine. I said, Lord, now this is an audacity of faith. I said, Lord, if the land is yours, the houses are yours, the building is yours, I, want, I don't want many. Just give me one big one. <laughs> so, you can believe God for something. I said, for something. Whatever's burning in your heart, ask Him. Ask Him. Hallelujah. Make sure for the next couple of days, whatever you need, ask Him. I said, ask him, he'll give it to you. Amen. Give the Lord a great hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I said, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Ooh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming your way.